check, check, one, two, one, two. Good evening, good evening out there. Welcome to Bible study. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Sunshine. Sunshine. Good evening, Sister Julia Ross, Sister Rhonda Quinn, Sister Tysha Cooper. Good evening, good evening. Let me see if I can get the chat visible. And we'll start in about three minutes when the song's over. Good evening, brother Justin Turner on YouTube. Good to see you. God bless you, my brother. Sunshine, Matthew 5, 14 to 16, our text for tonight. Good evening, Sister Darling Hill. Sister Darling Hill, good evening. Good evening, Sister Taisha Cooper. Good evening, Pastor Scott. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Brother Jameer Cunningham. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Sister Donna Davis. Sister Diane Williams. Good evening. To God be the glory. Amen. All the time. Good evening, Sister Stephanie Cunningham. Good evening. Good evening, Sister Teresa Turner. Sister Teresa Turner, good evening. God bless you. Shout out to the praise team. Good evening, Pastor Scott, and good evening. Let's just open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, humbly Lord God, just thanking you and praising you for all the wonderful things you have done. You are great and you are greatly to be praised, Lord God. Help us to bring glory to your name in all that we do, in word and in work, in word and in deed, in proclamation and in our practice. Help us to reflect the light of the world. Lord, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, to die on the cross for our sins and to be raised on the third day for our justification that all who are faithful to him shall not perish but have everlasting life shall not walk in darkness but will have the light of life we thank you lord god and we ask for forgiveness of our sins in the name of jesus christ please forgive us our trespasses we forgive those who trespass against us create in us a pure heart and renew a right spirit within us lord god lord god we thank you for the ability to gather as brothers and sisters virtually we thank you for facebook and youtube and twitter and the internet and all these things all these tools you've given us to make the gospel go viral viral to help the gospel go viral lord god so we ask you just to help us lord god be with us be with me tonight lord god allow the words in my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight O oh lord my rock and my redeemer in jesus name i do pray amen All right, so good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is July 20th, 2022. I'll turn this mic down a little bit so I don't get too much background noise. Let's take the chat away. Funny story, I went to Kohl's to get a yellow polo shirt to try to match the uh, background, but it wasn't showing up properly. So, oh, well. So orange, I think it's close. It's close enough. I try to match the backgrounds when I can. Check, check, one, two, one, two. Check, check. <clears throat> All right. Sunshine. S-O-N. Sunshine. 
Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Sunshine. Now, many of us may be familiar with the song that goes, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But what does it really mean to let our light shine? And what does Jesus mean when he tells his disciples, You, you are the light of the world? Isn't Jesus the light of the world? Well, as we'll see, we have to let our light shine, and not only sometimes. In this dark world, we all must be sunshine. Life isn't about getting the glory and the fame. It's about bringing glory to his name. Now, in context, as we discussed last week in Matthew 5.13, Christ has just said primarily to his disciples, In Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt is made tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is no longer useful for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Matthew 5, 13. As we've said, Worthless salt is not worth its salt. Let's heed the Savior's reasoning as to why we should be the Savior's seasoning. It's a moral imperative to be a moral preservative. You see, for millennia, salt has been known for its cleansing. Salt has been known for its cleansing, purifying, and preserving properties. Salt is antibacterial and antifungal. Likewise, we should combat the unbiblical bacteria of our earthly abode. We should fight against the faithless fungus upon which the world feasts. The moral standards of society are constantly changing, and they often decay like rotting meat. But by exemplifying the characteristics and conduct that Christ congratulates in the Beatitudes, we can help preserve the stinking, sinking, sinful society. By being righteous, we can work to prevent this wicked world from becoming so rank and rancid. By, be, by being most devoted to our master and deliverer, we can combat moral decay. As salt would preserve the meat in their land, we should help preserve the morals of our land. In our corrupt culture, we are to be moral preservatives. So let's not conform to the corrupt culture. Let's strive to conform the culture to Christ's commands. Let's work wisely to bring about true, lasting, covenantal peace, vertical peace, the reconciliation between God and mankind through the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ, that peace that leads to horizontal peace between followers of Christ. Let's endeavor, let's endeavor to prevent moral decay and add faithful flavor. Let's be salt of the earth, the preserving seasoning of heaven. Just a review of what we talked about last week. Good evening, Sister Michelle Giles, Sister Shelley Wimberly, Aunt Sandy, Sister Kim Rogers McLean, Sister Rena Civils. Sister Edith Alexander, Brother Kirk Peterson. Good evening, Sister Stephanie Cunningham. Good evening, Sister Darlene Hill, Pastor Scotton. Good evening, Brother Jameer Cunningham. God bless you all. Good evening, Sister Sarah Dorsey. Good evening. God bless you all. All right. So, after the Savior tells his disciples that they are to be moral preservatives and Christ-like condiments in this rotten world with poor taste, in the first part of Matthew 5.14, Jesus says, You, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Matthew 5.14a. Now, in Jewish literature, God, Adam, Adam, Israel, the temple, 
Jerusalem, and even certain prominent rabbis were all described as the light of the world. What's more, godly wisdom is also portrayed as light. For example, in Proverbs 6, 20 to 23, which is written as an address from a father who was passing down godly wisdom to his son, it says, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. And verse 23, for this command is a lamp. This teaching is a light. And correction and instruction are the way to life. Proverbs 6, 20 to 23. And in addition to godly wisdom, the Torah, the law of the Lord, was also described as light. For example, as you may recall, using similar language, Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. Moreover, by the, by the renowned writer Cicero, Rome, which was built on seven hills, was also called a light to the whole world. But here, once again, Jesus emphatically says to his disciples, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Now, lights can serve as a warning. If you're driving and you hit the brakes, your brake lights serve to warn drivers behind you that you are slowing down. Now, over the years, I've had many cars break down on me, at least four or five, and all of them were teenagers. And, one and when one pulls over to the side of the road to call for help, as I often had to do, it's important to put on your warning lights, your hazard lights. And, of course, when drivers are about to change lanes or turn, they're supposed to use their turn signal, their blinkers, their turning lights. Now, don't you hate when you're driving near someone and they merge or turn without any warning? Light can serve as a warning. Light can serve as a warning. Without warning lights, people can be on a collision course with calamity. And we who follow the great Christ should warn those who are in spiritual danger of a great crash. That said, light also attracts. Ever notice how moths are drawn to light? In the same way, the light of Christ in us should draw and attract others to the light of Christ. Furthermore, light also guides. You know, if you go camping... In order to see where you're going, it's important to bring a flashlight. And as the world turns during the soap opera of life, it's important to have a guiding light. You see, if you try to move around in the dark, it's easy to stumble and fall because one can't see. Nothing is visible. And perhaps most important of all, light is visible. Light is visible, and those who follow the Lord of light should also be visible. Those who follow the Lord of light should also be visible. Let me look at the chat real quick. Good evening, Sister Loretta Fisher. Hope you're, or hope you're doing well as well. Good evening, Aunt Sandy. Good evening, Deacon and Sister Deloach. Sister Dorothy Anderson Scott, good evening. God bless you all. Light is visible. So no wonder Jesus continues by saying, A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a measuring bowl, but rather on a lampstand. And so it shines light for all who are in the house. 
Matthew 5, 14 B to 15. Light is visible. And like unsalty salt, light that is not really visible is not really useful. Now, in Jesus' time, buildings were often built with limestone, which would gleam in the sunlight. They would shine in the sunshine. Also, especially at night, when it was dark, the many torch lights of a city on a hill would be visible for miles and miles around. Likewise, the many lights of Christians should be visible for miles and miles around. Now, we've already said that Rome was called a a light to the whole world. Also, Jesus could also be alluding to the nearby cities of Hippos, Gamala, or Sephoris, or Gamala, or Sephoris. But if Jesus is taking a dig at a certain city built on a hill, many scholars think that this city is Jerusalem, the holy city of God built on the mountain of God that was home to the temple of God. And it was prophesied that Jerusalem would be an important city for all nations, the whole world, in the last days. But in any case, whether or not Jesus is comparing or contrasting his followers with a certain city, the point is that a city on a hill cannot be hidden. It is visible. Furthermore, back in the day, people would typically light a lamp and put it on a lampstand so that the light would be visible to everyone in the house. And most homes back then only had one room, so one lamp would be sufficient to light the entire house. Also, bushels or measuring bowls were used to measure grain. Often held, they often held, held about two gallons, two gallons they could hold. And such bowls would be used to cover the fire of oil lamps, which would then extinguish the flame. Now, since I've had a few birthday parties over the years, thanks be to God, I'm used to just blowing out candles. However, my wife tells me that that's not the best way to extinguish the more sophisticated candles. You wouldn't want the wax and smoke to get blown all over the place, all over the house. Apparently, it's better to use the lid to cover the candle and put out the flame. Moreover, to minimize how much smoke and soot gets mixed into the candle, it's even better to use what's called a candle snuffer. A candle snuffer. Let me wipe away a little bit here. A candle snuffer. And the way people use candle snuffers to put out candles today is similar to how people use bowls to put out lamps back in the day. A candle snuffer will go over top of the wick and snuff out the flame. Now, if one wanted to be able to see What sense would it make to cover the lamp with a bowl and essentially put out the light? What sense does it make to turn on a flashlight and then hide the beam with one's hand? Why would you light a candle and then snuff out the flame? Light that is not visible is not useful. It's worthless. In the same way, What sense does it make to hide the truth of the Holy Gospel? What sense does it make to conceal the light of Christ? The purpose of a lamp is to give light. The purpose of a Christian is to give light. The purpose of being a Christian is to give light. Brothers and sisters, we can't be secret agents for the kingdom of God. We have to be public agents of moral preservation spiritual redemption, and enlightenment, true enlightenment. Look at the chat real quick. Good evening, Sister Norma Murray. 
Robin Rich Little, good evening. Sister Beverly Phillips. Sister Dorothy Anderson Scott, good evening. Sister Edith Alexander. Sister Gwen Gambrell. Sharon Scott, good evening. Good evening. God bless. All right, and our final verse for tonight. Shouldn't be before you long. So Jesus concludes this section by saying, In the same way, your lights must shine before others, that they may see your good works and may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Let me pause here. I don't know if you can hear the train going by. Good evening, Sister Carice Siler. Good evening. Like I said, I live near the train. Always goes by. And then uh, the airport's not too far away from me either, so I get some planes flying overhead too. All right, once more. In the same way, your light must shine before others that they may see your good works and may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Now, I know we're used to hearing the phrase, let your light shine. But I translate this differently to clarify, since in the Greek, this is actually a command. In Greek, this is actually a command. This is not optional advice. It's an authoritative order. This is not optional advice. It's an authoritative order. Christ isn't merely saying, let or allow your light to shine. He tells his disciples that their light must shine. This is a command of Christ. We must not take it lightly. Now, of course, the light that the disciples have is not purely their own. It is a reflection of the light of Jesus who is the light of the world. In John 8, 12, in one of Christ's seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, it says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, 12. Also see John 9, 5. We also read about the light of life and see a contrast between the light of Jesus and the darkness of the world in John 1 and John 3. You see, Jesus, Jesus is the one who brings spiritual light to those in this dark world who love evil deeds and darkness. Christ is a servant of the Lord who would illuminate the world with his message of light, as Isaiah prophesied. In Isaiah 42, 1, the Lord says through the prophet, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Isaiah 42, 1. Now earlier in Matthew three sixteen and 17, it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God, <clears throat> excuse me, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Very similar. The Spirit on him, here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight, in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> That's Matthew three sixteen to 17. And as we've mentioned in a previous study on Mark's account of Christ's baptism, this passage echoes Isaiah 42, 1, which, as we've seen, speaks of the Lord God putting his spirit, putting his spirit on his chosen servant, the servant in whom he delights, the servant with whom he is well pleased. Continuing in Isaiah 42, it says, he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. 
A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, like snuffing out a candle. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Isaiah 42, 2-4. Now, as we discussed before, in the first century, many, if not most Jews, were expecting a Messiah who would be a conquering king, not a suffering servant. As I heard a pastor explain recently, Jesus will come as a conquering king in his second coming. But in his first coming, he came as the suffering servant. <clears throat> in his earthly ministry, as we've said, the master was meek. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, he says, One second here. Good evening, Sister Patrick Lynch. Glad you like the title. Sunshine. We must let, we must have our light shine. Let me get Matthew eleven twenty nine for you. There we go. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest for your souls. That actually might be to verse 30. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 to 30. And that word gentle, prouse, as you saw before, is also translated as meek earlier. In the third beatitude, Matthew 5, 5, which we studied before, Christ pronounces a blessing on the meek, the gentle, prouse. As you study, the master's meek will inherit the Lord's land. And this prophecy from Isaiah 42 foretells of our meek master. Now, after Jesus heals a man's hand on the Sabbath and the Pharisees plot to kill him, and after he, after he withdraws and heals all those who are sick in the crowd that followed him, starting in Matthew twelve sixteen, it says, He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. So as you can see, this is a quotation of Isaiah 42, 1, which we saw just a few slides ago. Also echoed in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Continuing in Matthew 12, 19 to 21, it says, he will, not he will not quarrel or cry out. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. Matthew twelve nineteen to 21 So Matthew quotes Isaiah 42, 1 to 4, and says that Jesus, our meek master, fulfills this prophecy. He did not come as a brazen warlord, and did not want to fully reveal his messianic identity before it was truly his time to shine. And continuing, continuing in Isaiah 42, verse 5, it says, This is what 
God the Lord says, the creator of heavens, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. A light for the Gentiles. Now, in the context of Isaiah 42, the servant is actually Israel. But Israel fails in its role as God's servant to be a godly light to all nations. You'll see that in verse 18 and 19. Therefore, the Lord chooses one from within Israel to restore his people and to take upon himself the sin of God's faithful. In Isaiah 49, 6, the Lord of the Lord, it says. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 49, verse 6. You see, the prophesied servant of the Lord would be a light of salvation, not only for the people of Israel, but for the people but for the Gentiles throughout the earth. He will be a light for the whole world. And it was prophesied that the Son of God would be a light of salvation for the Gentiles in Isaiah, as well as a light of revelation for the Gentiles in Luke. You see, early in Luke chapter 2, we read of a man named Simeon. Starting at verse 25, it says, now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Luke 2, Luke 2, 25 to 26. Now, in this section in Luke 2, Joseph and Mary have brought baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to consecrate him to the Lord. And continuing, continuing in verse 27, it says of Simeon, Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, what the custom of the law required, verse 28, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. That's Luke two twenty nine to 32. So echoing Isaiah 42, 6 and Isaiah 49, 6, Simeon says that by seeing Jesus, he has seen the Lord's salvation and a light of revelation for the Gentiles. And the prophesied suffering servant of the Lord would bring about God's salvation by bearing the sin of God's people. As you may recall, later in Isaiah 53, 5, it says of the suffering servant, but he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The discipline that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. Thanks be to God, the Prince of Peace made peace between God and mankind through his atoning, sacrificial blood shed on the cross. When he was pierced, for our transgressions. And as we said, that vertical peace and reconciliation between God and God's people should lead to horizontal peace and reconciliation among God's people. And God's faithful people should reflect the light of the one who is the light of the world. 
in this dark world, we must be sunshine. We must let our light shine. And not only sometimes, not only sometimes, in this dark world, we all must be sunshine. I'll look at the chat real quick. Amen, Sister Siler. Good evening, Sister Alice Palmer. Good evening. Good to see you. God be the glory. Amen. Sister Marva Boone, good evening. Sister Yvonne Rhodes, good evening. Brother and Sister Terry, or Brother and Sister Tobin and Terry Rice, good evening to you. God bless you. Amen. Sister Hill, Sister Sylvia Johnson, good evening. <clears throat> we must let the sun shine. Now, in Acts 13, on the Sabbath, Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch, giving people the good news, explaining from the scriptures that Jesus, the resurrected Lord, is in fact the Messiah. And after they finished speaking in the synagogue, many Jews and converts to Judaism followed them. Then starting in Acts 13, 44, it says, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on them. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. Verse 47, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So Paul and Barnabas also quote Isaiah 49.6. That was Acts 13.47, Acts 13.44-47. So Paul and Barnabas also quote Isaiah 49.6, which speaks of the prophesied servant of the Lord being a light of salvation for the Gentiles, for all nations to the ends of the earth. And notice how Paul and Barnabas apply this passage which was previously applied to Jesus, to themselves. Jesus is the prophesied light of salvation for the world. And Paul and Barnabas also claim to be a light of salvation for the world. For as followers of Christ, they have been commissioned to continue the mission of the Messiah, who is the light of the world. In this sense, Paul and Barnabas are in fact acting as the light of the world. Just as Jesus tells his disciples emphatically in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. You see, we who bring the message of salvation through Jesus Christ to light are the light of the world. We who bring, you see, we who bring the message of the salvation through Jesus Christ to light, the message of salvation through Jesus Christ to light are the light of the world. In this dark world, in this sinful society, we must be sunshine. Sunshine. Now later in Acts 26, when Paul is testifying and sharing the gospel for, before King Agrippa, after his earlier persecution, he says, But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike, I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and, as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Acts 26, 22 to 23. You see, as in the cases with Jesus and Paul and Barnabas, to be the light of the world, it's important to bring the message of light to the world. And this is what Jesus did since the beginning of his public ministry. Beginning in Matthew 4, 12 to 14, it says, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Verse 15, Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, 
Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. A light has dawned. It's quoting Isaiah 9, 1 to 2. Verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew 4, 17. So Matthew explains how the appearance and preaching of Jesus the Messiah was a light to the Gentiles and people living in darkness. Also a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 9, 1 to 2. And we who bring the message of the master like Paul and Barnabas, we who bring the sunshine like the disciples, we are the light of the world. So as we've seen in the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah, the prophesied servant of the Lord was to be the one who would be a light to all nations illuminating the truth of the good news of salvation through the reign of God. And the message, the gospel, the good news of the coming kingdom of God was also symbolized as light. Thus, the Lord's people who reflect the light of the Lord can also be described as a light of the world. In Isaiah 61-3, Isaiah prophesies of the Lord's people saying, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Verse 3, Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Isaiah 60, 1-3. You see, the light of the Lord would first shine on the Lord's people who are to then reflect the Lord's light to all nations of the world. So the Lord's people are to reflect the light of the Lord Jesus and the master's messengers who bring his message to light are also the light of the world. Later in Matthew 10, 40, when Jesus sends out his, his disciples to preach the good news, when he sends out his disciples to preach the good news, he tells them, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Matthew 10, 40. As we've seen before in our study of Christ's teaching on the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, Jesus says that, the way people treat the least of these brothers and sisters of his is the way they treat him. How one receives the master's messenger reflects how one receives the master's message and therefore how one receives the master himself. In John thirteen twenty, Jesus tells his disciples, Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. John 13, 20. Now, earlier, starting at Acts 26, 12, when Paul is telling King Agrippa how he used to persecute the church and hunt Christians down in foreign cities, he says, On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. It's Acts 26, 12 to 14. So when Paul, who was also called Saul, was persecuting the church, he was really persecuting Jesus. For how one treats the master's messenger 
is how one treats the master. If one rejects Christ's messengers who bring the message of light, one therefore rejects Christ, who is the true light. Jesus is the light of the world, and we are to reflect the light to the world. We have to let our light shine, and not just sometimes. In this dark world, we all must be sunshine. We should reflect Christ, the light of the world, by spreading his message of the light of revelation and salvation. By spreading his message of light, the message of the light of revelation and salvation. We should strive to turn people from darkness to light. From darkness to light. Continuing in Acts 26, 15, Paul says, Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Acts 26, 15 to 18. You see, Paul was commissioned to turn people from the darkness of the world to the light of Christ. From the power of the devil to the power of the deliverer. Brothers and sisters, to be the light of the world, it's important to bring the message of light to the world. That people might repent and see the light and receive forgiveness of their sins through faith in the Savior. As followers of Christ, the suffering servant who fulfills the messianic prophecies, we should spread the good news of salvation through Christ to bring light to all nations of the world. That said, similar to the metaphor fruit, which is found throughout Matthew, in general, light refers to all of our good works that we do in obedience to the Lord. And of course, evangelism is an important part of our good works. Yet, such good works also include deeds of righteousness, love, and compassion to others. Various deeds of righteousness, love, and compassion to others. When we do such good works, it demonstrates our faithfulness to God. It makes the good news of Christ more believable. And it causes others to glorify our Father who is in heaven. There's many other passages we could cite about light being righteous conduct and righteousness. But for now, I'll leave that for later. I'll put those scriptures online uh, later. But brothers and sisters, our entire lifestyle, our entire lifestyle should be attractive and should bring glory to God. We must have both the good word and a good walk. We must speak out for the truth of the gospel. And we must live out the truth of the gospel. We must reflect the light of Christ in both proclamation and practice. Brothers and sisters, in this world, we are not to fit in. We are to stand out. But we don't stand out to bring glory to ourselves. We ought to stand out to bring glory to our Heavenly Father as more and more people submit their lives to the King. We become distinct, holy, set-apart children of our Heavenly Father by submitting our lives to His kingship. Now, referring to God as King and Father is an awesome combination of metaphors. 
And this is the first time God is called Father in the Gospel of Matthew. You see, God was only sometimes called Father in the Old Testament and by contemporary Jews by contemporary Jews around the time of Jesus. But Christ transformed the way we think of our Father, who art in heaven. For our King is exalted above us, and yet he is so close to us. We are the royal children of our Father, who are to bring glory to our King. Glory to God. Amen. Sister Gail McGinnis Scott, Minister Spring, good evening. Amen, Sister Dorothy Anderson Scott. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, as the song says, Sister Gail and her Brother Turner. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Good evening, Sister Maddie Long. Amen, Sister Rhodes. Amen, Sister Hill. Good evening, Sister Ruth Sibbles. Amen, Sister Marva Boone. Hallelujah. Now, when I was out in public with my parents, on more than one occasion, they told me, boy, don't you embarrass me out here. Don't you embarrass me. You see, whether it's right or not, a child's bad behavior can reflect poorly on their parents. But a child's good behavior can bring honor to their parents. Likewise, let's not let our works reflect poorly on our Heavenly Father. Let's reflect the light of our Lord. And you know, children look like their father, and we ought to have a holy family resemblance that brings honor to our Father. And with the very next chapter, in Matthew 6, 1, Jesus says, Take care not to practice your righteousness in front of people, in order to be spectated by them. If indeed you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Matthew 6, 1. Now, at first glance, this may seem contradictory. I mean, are we, to, are we supposed to let others see our good works? Are we supposed to let others see our righteous good works or not? Well, what counts is our motive. What counts is our motive. Lord willing, when we get to Matthew 6, we'll see that there, Christ is referring to people who like to put on a big show when it comes to their giving, praying, and fasting in order to be seen by others. Such actors want their works to be visible so they can bring recognition and glory to themselves. We should want our works to be visible so that we can bring recognition and glory to God. So it's wise to question the motive, the motives of our motions. Are we seeking to bring glory to God? Or are we seeking to bring glory to ourselves? In Colossians 3.17, Paul tells, <clears throat> Paul tells the Colossian church, And whatever you do, in word or in work, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians three seventeen. And whatever you do, in word or in work, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. All in the name of the Lord Jesus. All of our words and works should reflect the light of the Lord and bring glory to his name. Now, you know, one of the biggest lies our society tells us is that our lives are primarily about us. That my life is all about me, about what I want to do. Society tells us to follow our dreams, to pursue our passions, Society tells us that no matter what anyone else has to say, we should do what makes us happy. However, if we are truly children of our Heavenly Father, we are not to live for ourselves, we are to live for our Savior. 
Our purpose isn't to try to make a name for ourselves. We were created to make his name glorious. Our primary aim is not to do what makes us happy. It's to do what makes us holy. You know, sometimes we call each other kings and queens. Yet we are not even the queen or king of our own life. We are servants and children of the king of all life. With our whole hearts, we must be committed to the king of the world, living as the light of the world. And we are to be in the world, not of the world. In both of these metaphors, Christ makes it clear that we must be distinct, holy, and set apart. We can't conform to the culture. We can't follow all the world's fashions and try all the world's trends. Followers of Christ shouldn't seek to keep up with the Joneses, but seek to keep up with Jesus. We have to be the salt that prevents moral decay and adds Christ-like flavor. We have to be the light that dispels darkness and attracts others to Christ. You see, salt and light go hand in hand. We must stop the spread of evil and promote the spread of truth. Get a chat real quick. Amen. Walk in the light, beautiful light. Let our light shine all over the world. Amen. That's Sandy. Mrs. Cooper says, let that have reminded us to not be secret witness, but public witnesses for Jesus. We must be sunshine, a light in this wicked and sinful world. Amen. Mrs. Arena Civil says, praying that my works bring honor to my Heavenly Father. No recognition needed here on earth. Amen. Amen, Sister Gail. Amen, Mrs. Cooper. We can't be secret agents, can't be secret, secret service. Why well, put a, no one, you know, puts a light on a lampstand, or no one puts a, uh, lights a lamp and then puts it under a bowl, under a bushel. They put it on a lampstand so everyone can see it. Have to let our light shine. We must let our light shine. We must be salt and light. Now, have you ever put salt in a wound? Ever get a cut in your mouth and rinse out your mouth with salt water? You know, we've we've discussed the cleansing, purifying, and preserving properties of salt. But we know that when salt comes into contact with an open wound, it doesn't feel too good, does it? Now, have you ever been sitting in a dark room for a long time and then someone turns on the light? It doesn't feel too good, does it? Now, has anyone ever told you that something you really like to do is wrong? doesn't feel too good, does it? As you said before, people love it when you tell them what they want to hear. And that's what false prophets have been doing for millennia. But true prophets tell people what they need to hear. And when we speak out against something people shouldn't be doing, that's when we ruffle feathers. Like Jesus, we must tell people to repent and believe the gospel. And we must understand that many times, that's not going to feel nice. It's not going to feel too good. It's going to feel like salt in a wound. It's going to feel like a bright light shined in eyes that have adjusted to darkness. That have gotten used to darkness. Therefore, we shouldn't always expect positive reactions to being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. As you may recall, as we've studied at the end of the Beatitudes, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 10 to 12, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you whenever they insult you and persecute you and falsely speak all kinds of evil, all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets before you. It's Matthew 5, 10 and Matthew 5, 11 to 12. Brothers and sisters, 
don't be surprised when people are offended by your saltiness or shine. That's cause for rejoicing because we're in good company. Also in John 3, 19 to 21, it says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done. So that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. John three nineteen to 21. Now, we've studied John 3 in greater detail before, but my point here is that people who love evil hate the light. People who love evil hate the light. This is why the world hates Christians and the world hates Christ. Moreover, in John 15, 18 and 19, Jesus tells his disciples, Christ tells his disciples, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. John 15, 18 and 19. You see, it should be no surprise when worldly people with their worldly actions and attitudes are accepted by the world. But though we are in the world, we are not to be of the world. If we sought worldly acclaim and pursued worldly passions and chased worldly dreams, we would belong to the world. But those of us who truly belong to our Father in heaven should have his family resemblance. That is holiness. We shouldn't seek the glory of the world, but the glory of God. If we do, just like Jesus, we will likely be hated by the world. But just like Jesus, we are to be the light of the world and we are to be the salt of the earth. Sometimes you tell people about themselves in the name of Jesus, but what shouldn't be done in the name of Jesus it's going to feel like salt in the wound, like shining a light in someone's eyes who are so used to the darkness. But we are commanded to be the light of the world anyway. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, we can't be secret agents for the kingdom of God. We have to be public agents of moral preservation, spiritual redemption, and enlightenment just as salt that is not salty is not useful light that is not visible is not useful it's worthless yet we must live a life worthy of the calling we have received we are called to be salt of the earth light of the world and let's not take Christ's command lightly we must reflect the light of our Lord Jesus, the prophesied suffering servant of Isaiah, who brought the gospel message of salvation in the kingdom of God as a light to all nations. We have to let our light shine, and not only sometimes. In this dark world, we all must be sunshine. Life isn't about getting the glory and the fame. It's about bringing glory to his name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. All right, praise the Lord. Thank you for uh, sticking with us tonight. Right on time. Praise the Lord. Good to see you, Sister Yvonne Rhodes, Sister Robin Borden, Sister Vanetta Harvin, Vanetta Harvin, Sister Lena Mitchell Savage. Good evening. Good evening. Sister Gail McGinnis, God, have a blessed night. Glory to God. Let's close a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, humble Lord God, asking you to help us to walk in the light, beautiful light, 
help us to let our light shine and knowing that we must we must have our light shine that we must reflect the light of our Lord Jesus Christ in all that we do in words and in works Lord God in our evangelism in our works of righteousness and love and compassion towards others help our light to shine not so we can bring recognition to our name not so we can bring glory to our name but so people will glorify our Father in heaven and help us to have that family resemblance Lord God Let it help us to be holy as you are holy Lord God and Lord God we thank you for sending Jesus Christ into the world as the light of the world to be a light not only for Israel but a light for the Gentiles a light for the, the nations a light for the whole world the ends of the earth that all can be saved and accept the message of salvation we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and to be raised on the third day for our justification that all who are faithful to Jesus and his sacrificial atoning work on the cross will not perish will not taste spiritual death but will have eternal spiritual life we thank you for the good news Lord God help us to be good messengers of the good message for we know that when people reject the messenger they're really rejecting you and when people accept the messenger they are accepting you Lord God so help us to go boldly as your ambassadors proclaiming your your message with authority Lord God for you are truly the author and the finisher of our faith help us to walk in the light Lord God and not be ashamed help us to not hide our light under a bushel and extinguish the flame a city built on a hill cannot be hidden Lord God so let's not hide the gospel let's not hide the good news of Jesus Christ let's not hide our good works help them to bring glory to your name Lord God we thank you the light of the world help us to reflect your light in the world we thank you for this time Lord God we ask you to be with all the people who are watching right now and in the future Lord God please touch them right now in the name of Jesus Lord God you know exactly what they stand in need of and we ask you to help us to gather here once more next week to gather to tomorrow night virtually in prayer and tomorrow morning and to uh, gather on Sunday in worship Lord God help us to shine in all that we do help us to be sunshine in this dark world may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace in Jesus name I do pray amen Thank you all for joining us tonight. God bless you all. All right, sister. Darling Hill. Glory to God. God is great. Appreciate you. Amen, sister Dorothy Anderson Scott. Auntie Lynn Stevenson, good evening. Amen, amen. Have a blessed evening, sister Shelley Wimberly. Sister Yvonne Rose, hallelujah. Thank you for watching, Sister Gwen Gambrell. Glory to God. Yes, Lord, help us with all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Sister Siler. Hold up our lights and let it shine. Amen, Sister Turner. Sister Pat, enjoy your evening as well. Thank you so much. Praying for Grandma in Chicago. Sister Julia Ross, glory to God. May God bless you as well. Have a good night. We must stand up, stand out for Jesus. Light stands out in the darkness. Amen, Sister Boone. Stand up and stand out for Jesus. Glory to God, Sister Siler. Amen, Sister Savage. Amen, Sister Sibbles. May the Lord bless you as well, Sister Rhodes. Amen, Sister Wimberly. Good evening, Sister Jada Gasson. Let you catch up here. Glory to God, Sister Siler, Auntie San Aunt Sandy, God bless you. May the Lord bless you and your family as well. Amen, Sister Rose. Amen, Sister Harvin. Glory to God. Pastor Scott, and have a good night. God is awesome. God bless you, Sister Dorsey. And may the Lord bless you always as well. Thank you, Sister Stephanie Cunningham. Sister Cunningham, God bless you. Nothing but the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God.
Good night, Sister Jada Gaston. Good evening. And good night. God bless you all. Good evening, Sister Fisher. Have a blessed evening. God bless you. To God be the glory. So, next week, we got to see. I got to see what we'll do next week. Glory to God, Sister uh, Cunningham and Brother Cunningham. See you in the morning for morning prayer. Lord willing. God bless you. All right, so next week. I'm not sure if we'll continue with the Sermon on the Mount next week. Because this next section is very important. Matthew 5, 17 to 20. I might need some extra time to prepare that. So I might switch things up next week. We'll see. I'm not sure yet. But Lord willing, we'll see you next week. I want to see you uh, tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening for prayer and on Sunday for worship. In on Sunday, in service or online for worship. God bless you. Make sure you let your light shine. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. God bless. You.